Good morning and thank you so much for joining us again for our worship service from the ICF in Portimao, Portugal. Let's go to the Lord for a moment of prayer as we open his word together. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to worship you together. Although separated by distance, we are together in your spirit. And most importantly, Lord, you are here with us. And we pray, Lord, today that you would just open our hearts, open our minds to hear and see what it is that you want us to see and hear. So, Lord, speak to us through your word, we pray this day. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, today we're going to return to Luke 6 and we're going to look at four A's. Ambassadors, actions, affirmations and admonitions. First, we see Jesus choosing ambassadors for his kingdom. Then we see him performing actions of compassion for the kingdom. And then we see him giving both affirmations and admonitions regarding how to live as citizens of that kingdom. In all that Jesus does and says, he shows a clear kingdom perspective. So let's begin with kingdom ambassadors. Jesus knows that the time has come to train leaders. This is partly because opposition from the Pharisees is increasing and some of them are already plotting his death. So he knows that his time on earth is limited. It's also because he knows he can't do the work alone. There's way too much to do. There are thousands of people to reach with the message of the kingdom, the good news, and one person on their own can't possibly reach them all. The men Jesus chooses will be his ambassadors, representing him, preaching his message, multiplying his work. He's training them to continue the ministry that he has begun. Now it's very significant that before Jesus chooses the twelve, he spends the entire night in prayer. This gives us great insight into the importance of the choice ahead of him. The men he selects will be given his authority. They will be acting on his behalf. And so he needs people who will be faithful to him, faithful to proclaim his message, not just now, but also after he has returned to heaven. He needs men who will be strong and courageous as they face opposition, men who will show his love and compassion to others and who will live out the values of his kingdom. Eventually, Jesus would be handing over his whole ministry to these men. So it was a huge decision that needed much guidance from his heavenly father. So after spending the night on the mountainside in prayer, Jesus called together his disciples and out of this large group of followers, he selected 12 to be his apostles. Now the word apostle means one who is sent out with a message. These men would now be full-time ambassadors for the kingdom of God, preaching the message with their words and living it out with their lives. There were many disciples, not just 12, but there were only 12 hand-picked apostles. The future of the church rested with them and they would be the ones to guarantee the authenticity of the gospel message. Mark 3, 14 tells us, Jesus appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Now, it's interesting that along with preaching and driving out evil spirits, one of the reasons for choosing the twelve was human companionship. Mark says he chose them that they might be with him. Jesus valued friendship and fellowship, just as we do. Abraham is called the friend of God, and God spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. So we see that Jesus needed human companionship as well, just as we do. Now you may wonder why he chose 12. This number corresponds to the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus was now setting up a new community of faith, 
And just as the 12 tribes had represented the nation of Israel, now these 12 men represented the king and his kingdom. 1 Peter 2.9 says of all believers, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Now today in the 21st century, a person with an important message might write a book or buy airtime on television or post a blog on the internet to share his message with the world. But 2,000 years ago, long before the arrival of modern media, Jesus chose 12 men. He would write his message on their hearts and they would be his living books for all the world to read. The 12 men Jesus chose were very ordinary people with no special credentials. They weren't influential or famous, but they had faith in Jesus as their Messiah and they were willing to learn from him and trust him. And that was the most important thing. There were at least four fishermen in the group, Peter, Andrew, James and John, a tax collector, Matthew, and a political fanatic, Simon the Zealot. The others are mostly just names to us, but they weren't to Jesus. In every one of these men, he saw great potential to work in his harvest field and to bring people into the kingdom of God. He trusted each of them with his message and his authority. Now as I read the list of names, I think of Peter, the disciple who had his weak moments but became a fearless leader of the Christian church. I think of Andrew, the one who quietly introduced his brother Peter to Jesus. I think of James, one of the sons of thunder who would be the first to lay down his life as a martyr for our Lord. His brother John, a close friend of Jesus, who wrote five books of the New Testament. I think of Philip, who really wanted to see the Father. Bartholomew, sometimes called Nathaniel, the one who was known for his honesty. I think of Matthew, who gave up his profitable tax-collecting business to follow Jesus. And God used his training in carefully recording facts to give us one of our treasured Gospels. I think of Thomas, the one who doubted for a moment, but once he saw the resurrected Jesus, believed with all his heart and cried out, My Lord and my God. I think of Simon the Zealot, who'd been a patriot for Israel, yet learned to get on peacefully with Matthew, who'd once collected taxes for the enemy of Israel, Rome. I think of James, the son of Alphaeus, and Judas, son of James, who are only names to us, but we know they were faithful followers of our Lord Jesus. And then last on the list is the man who puzzles us all, Judas Iscariot, the man who will always be remembered as the one who betrayed Jesus. And as I read the list of names of the apostles, I can't help wondering to myself, why did Jesus choose Judas? He knew that eventually he would betray him, and yet he still chose him. Maybe this was one of the things he was struggling with as he wrestled in prayer all night, knowing that one of his closest friends, one of his own apostles, would send him to the cross. Judas was sent out preaching the good news of the kingdom, just like the other eleven, and for a while he followed Jesus and appeared to do all the things he should. Judas remains a mystery to us. Maybe the question we should be asking instead is, why did God choose me? Why did he choose you? He loves each of us and he sees potential in all of us. But it's up to us if we will be faithful and follow him to the very end. Oh,
Kingdom ambassadors. Now let's look at kingdom actions. After Jesus chooses his 12 apostles, he goes down with them to a level place where a large crowd of people is waiting. They've come from all over Judea in the south and even from the Gentile towns of Tyre and Sidon in the north. They've made the long journey for two reasons, to hear Jesus teach and to be healed of their illnesses. Jesus is not going to disappoint them. So before he starts to teach and meet their spiritual needs, he takes time to attend to their practical needs by healing all of those who are ill. In this huge crowd of thousands, God allowed people to be healed by just reaching out in faith to touch Jesus as they crowded around him. It would have been almost impossible for Jesus to go to each one and talk with them individually and touch each one as he had done in the past. And so here God allows a different way for people to be healed. They come to him and touch him and they are healed. Some are troubled by evil spirits and many have physical ailments, but none are disappointed. Luke tells us the people all tried to touch him because power was coming out of him and healing them all. And it's in this context that Jesus then begins to teach the people. They've witnessed God's power in the many miracles that they have seen. They have witnessed his love in action before they hear about it in words. The miracles are like an appetizer before the main meal. The people are now excited and hungry to learn more about God. And through these miracles, Jesus is also showing his apostles ways in which they too will be demonstrating the love and compassion of God 
to a needy world. Now, with their immediate needs met, the people are ready and willing to listen to the message that Jesus brings them. His message has been called the greatest discourse in the world and has inspired countless millions of people. In it, Jesus teaches his followers and would-be followers how to live. It's not a message of salvation, but rather a message of how to live and how to think as citizens of the kingdom of God. In the synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus had quoted Isaiah 61, which begins, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And in this sermon, Jesus begins with the same theme of the poor and the brokenhearted. Jesus is their promised Messiah and has come to bring them comfort. And so he begins with a series of kingdom affirmations. Each one begins with the word blessed, which is a word of congratulations. We often call these sayings beatitudes, and so they are. But they're also bombshells, revolutionary in thought, and quite the opposite of what people were expecting to hear. Each statement seems to be a paradox as Jesus shows that the values of his kingdom are completely opposite to the values of this world. In each statement, it's the second half of the saying that explains the first. And so he begins, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Most of the people listening to Jesus lived on the poverty level. Jesus wasn't saying it was a blessing to be poor. He was saying that those who are poor, who believe in him, have great wealth because they possess all of the spiritual riches of his kingdom. They are in fact the wealthiest people of all, and that is why they are truly blessed. As Isaiah foretold, Jesus the Messiah is preaching good news to the poor. And then secondly, blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. The land of Israel was overpopulated and underproductive, most people barely had enough to eat and had very little, if any, extra. It was only rarely that they ate a meal which really filled them up. Jesus wasn't saying it was a blessing to be hungry. If it were, he wouldn't have taken the time to feed 5,000 people on a hillside with a little boy's lunch. No, Jesus was saying that those who are hungry now who believe in him will be completely satisfied because he will meet all the needs of their hearts. In the end, they will be the most satisfied people of all. And that's why they are blessed. And then thirdly, blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Life was fragile in first century Palestine before the advent of modern medicine. And many people died young. The average life expectancy was between 30 and 35 years. So death was common, and it wasn't unusual for children to die, either at birth or in infancy. Jairus' daughter died at age 12, and a widow in Nain lost her only son when he was just a young man. We know that the loss of loved ones always causes great grief and sadness. And Jesus certainly wasn't saying it's a blessing to weep. No, if it were, he wouldn't have bothered to bring Lazarus back to life or the widow's son of Nain, or Jairus' daughter. No. What Jesus was saying is that for those who believe in him, death is not the end, for he gives spiritual life that goes on forever and brings great joy. That's why those who weep now, but also believe in him, are blessed, even though they suffer grief at the moment. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, Weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. As Isaiah foretold, here we see Jesus the Messiah bringing comfort to the sorrowful. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And then the last affirmation is, Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy 
because great is your reward in heaven. For that's how their fathers treated the prophets. As Jesus spoke these words, he must have been thinking especially of his closest followers who would remember his words when persecution came. In Acts 5.41, when the apostles were flogged for teaching about Jesus, they rejoiced that they had been considered worthy to suffer disgrace for his name. The persecution would get worse and eventually ten of the original twelve apostles would be killed for their faith. Now Jesus wasn't saying it was a blessing to be hated or even killed. Rather he was saying that their reward in heaven would far surpass the trials of this life. And that was why they were blessed. And now after the kingdom affirmations we come to the kingdom admonitions. Four blessings are followed in Luke by four woes, which serve to reinforce the truths already stated. The blessings and woes are in fact like two sides of the same coin. They teach the same truth, but from a different perspective. Words of comfort are now replaced by words of caution. These admonitions are addressed to people in the crowd who do not yet believe in Jesus as their Messiah. They think that they are self-sufficient and have no need for the king or his kingdom. Jesus says to them, But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. The rich thought that they had everything they needed, and so they ignored God and the spiritual riches that he could give them. But the worldly wealth that they had in this life was all that they were going to get. They had nothing more to look forward to in heaven, and so they were to be pitied. And Jesus is not saying that wealth in itself is bad, but that riches can easily keep a person from trusting in God to meet their needs, and that is a colossal disadvantage to them. You may remember the rich young ruler who wanted to follow Jesus but couldn't part with his wealth, and he went away very sad. Then secondly, woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. For those who were well fed and satisfied with what they had achieved and earned by themselves, there was no promise of fullness in the future. The only thing awaiting them was hunger, because they were relying on themselves. There would be nothing to bring them real satisfaction. Now Jesus isn't saying that it's wrong to have a good meal. But we should acknowledge that everything we have is from the Lord's hand. We should share what we have with others. All our eating and drinking is to be for the glory of God. Now this admonition is well illustrated in Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The man who had lived and eaten in luxury all his life, thinking only of himself, ended up as the person to be pitied. Whereas Lazarus, a poor beggar down here, ended up in heaven. On earth he had just longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But now in heaven he was truly satisfied. And then thirdly, woe to you who laugh now for you will mourn and weep. Here Jesus isn't talking about wholesome laughter, but rather about a way of life characterised by self-sufficiency and satisfaction with merely physical and material things. He's talking about people whose life philosophy is eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. For them, the future holds only sorrow because they will eventually discover that their lives are empty and meaningless. And then lastly, woe to you when all men speak well of you for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. Here Jesus is referring to people who don't challenge the values of this world. They allow injustice and wrong to continue because they want to please others instead of please God. They are like the false prophets of old who were people pleasers. They've settled for an approach to life that doesn't challenge them to live any differently. They don't realise that they are accountable to God and one day will have to stand before them before him. Now the Beatitudes of this world can be seen in popular book titles today, 
such as how to get rich, secrets of wealthy people, how to win friends and influence people, happiness now. The Beatitudes of Jesus are very, very different. In fact, they're totally opposite. In this first part of his sermon that we've seen today, Jesus turns the values of this world completely upside down. In all that Jesus did and said, he had a kingdom perspective. Through the ambassadors he chose, thousands of people would come to faith in him as their Messiah and Saviour. And God would even use the treachery of Judas because it would take Jesus to the cross where he would redeem us. Through the actions of Jesus, people saw the love and compassion of God and were drawn to him. After being awake all night, we would have wanted to rest, but Jesus gave himself fully to meet the needs of others. Through the affirmations of Jesus, he brought comfort to those who were oppressed and downtrodden, showing that because they believed in him, they were truly blessed and had eternal spiritual riches in God's kingdom. Through the admonitions of Jesus, he challenged those who thought they were self-sufficient. There was still time for them to turn around and repent and believe in him. Everything Jesus did and said was from the perspective of God's kingdom. And he challenges us today. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be yours as well. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this teaching that you have given us. Thank you, Lord, how you challenge us to look at things from the perspective of the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Lord, that you teach us not to look at our circumstances and consider us ourselves blessed because of our circumstances. But you teach us, Lord, to consider ourselves blessed because if we know you, we have great riches indeed. We have all that we need. And so, Lord, our temporary circumstances here are not significant from your perspective of eternity. Help us to see that, Lord. Help us to look at our circumstances and the world around us from your perspective. Lord, whether our circumstances right now are good or bad, help us to trust you completely. Help us to see that the most important thing is knowing you and having our spiritual riches in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.